following subject matter is real and only intended for mature audiences. Discretion is advised. People are dead after deputies say a man went on a shooting rampage. I knew a week before she died I was going to kill her. I can tell you the scene out there is absolutely horrific. Nobody knows where this individual may strike next. This is 10 Minute Murder. Hi there. Welcome. I'm Joe, the host, and thank you for joining today. Of the 1.2 million true crime podcasts out there, you chose this one to listen to today, and I appreciate it. But there is a chance that if you hear me say what I'm about to say, you aren't going to want to listen anymore. And that's fine. We all have different opinions, different perspectives, and different life experiences. And this is going to be potentially politically incorrect, and it might cause problems for me personally, but know that I mean no disrespect. I just feel like I should say publicly what I've said privately for a long time. And that is, receiving presents from people is stressful, especially if you have to open them in front of whoever gave it to you. They're looking at your face for a reaction to see if you like whatever it is. And if you like me, I could be in a fantastic mood, but my face looks like I'm working out math equations in my head. So what I'm saying is that giving gifts is problematic unless you handle it correctly. And be mindful of that as we are in the gift-giving season right now. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Honestly, it's one of the most awkward things ever when someone gives you a gift and just stands there and stares at you. I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate the gift, but stop looking at me. If I don't like it, I'm just going to lie to your face. So do us both a favor and don't make me do that. Okay, I'm done. Let's get to today's story. Farmville is a sleepy small town of 8,000 people located just in the center of Virginia. And maybe right now is the first time you're hearing about Farmville not being associated with a Facebook game. This is a real place, and one of those places where you would usually say nothing ever happens, or at least how it used to be before the fall of 2009. That September, residents of Farmville were left horrified when the bodies of a local college professor, a church minister, and two teenage girls were found bludgeoned to death. The shock was not erased when the police discovered the murderer was just a teenage boy, an aspiring hardcore rapper called Psycho Sam. Trying to make sense of such a brutal crime, many were quick to blame the music genre and its dark, violent lyrics, which incorporate themes such as death, murder, suicide, and mental illness. Can you really use music as a scapegoat, or should we keep our focus on the perpetrator themselves? In this case, on the man behind the artist's name, 20-year-old Richard McCroskey. Richard Samuel McCroskey III was born December 23, 1988, in Hayward, California, where he grew up with his older sister, Sarah. The family later moved to Castro Valley around 2003. Sarah described the McCroskey household as more like a place filled with roommates, not family members. Quote, we were not a leave it to beaver type of family. We each had our own space and did our own thing. In high school, Sam was bullied nonstop because of his weight and red hair. It eventually broke the young man's confidence and left him with many insecurities. Still, according to his sister, Sam was a mild-mannered and kind-hearted person who never fought back or even said anything unless he was provoked enough. Feeling despondent at school, Sam dropped out of Tennyson High School in Hayward. He wondered if things would turn out better at Hayward High, but Sam quickly dropped out again, and so did his sister. Quote, We both fell into the wrong crowd, but high school was just uncomfortable for Sammy. He was just unhappy. He couldn't do it. What did bring Sam happiness was music. The aspiring rapper would spend hours and hours recording in his room. It was Sam's way of coping and relaxing and escaping reality. In addition, his niche, the underground hardcore scene, was a way for Sam to create a more tough-looking, tough-sounding image for himself. While his sister later said Sam's artist name, Psycho Sam, was just a stage name and not his alter ego, it was clear that Sam used the persona he had created as armor to protect himself from the world. While Sam was a meek, insecure, and withdrawn person in real life, in his online fantasy world, he was able to be whoever he wanted to be. On the popular social networking site MySpace, Sam portrayed himself as a tough and confident guy, as someone who is in control. We all know it's easy to hide your true self behind the screen, in good and in bad. As for Sam's case, his fake online persona proved disastrous. It all started when Sam came across the MySpace profile of 16-year-old Emma Niederbrock. Emma, 
who lived in Farmville, Virginia, was described as a bright and beautiful young woman. Seeing herself as a goth, Emma only wore black, dyed her hair bright pink, and went by the name Ragdoll. Like Sam, she was part of the online horrorcore community and was active on MySpace. There, the two soon began talking with regularity through direct messaging. Sam thought Emma was smart and cute and, of course, loved how she looked up to him as a hardcore rapper. Soon, in Sam's eyes, Emma was his online and long-distance girlfriend. However, Emma saw things differently. While the two talked all the time and Emma flirted with Sam, openly professing her love for him, she still did not really see him as anything other than a close friend. While Sam saw Emma as his girlfriend, she never referred to him as her boyfriend. It would be Sam's misplaced expectations that would eventually lead not just to heartbreak, but to disaster. In September 2009, after over a year of having an online, quote, relationship, it was time for Sam and Emma to meet up in person. There was a hardcore music festival being held in Southgate, Michigan, called Strictly for the Wicked. Emma's parents, Deborah and Mark, who were still close despite their divorce, had agreed to let Emma's friends, Melanie and Sam, stay at Deborah's house in Farmville for the concert week. On September 12th, Sam flew to Virginia, most likely overly excited to finally meet his girlfriend. But unfortunately, the reality of the situation hit him straight in the face at the Richmond airport, where Emma and her mother came to pick him up. The girl Sam had thought was in love with him pulled back straight away after the two saw each other. Emma was simply not attracted to Sam, who, according to her, seemed nothing like his tough and cool online persona. Sam, who immediately felt the rejection, was left devastated. Nevertheless, Emma's parents then drove Emma, Melanie, and Sam to the concert in Michigan. The drive alone had to be extremely awkward, but it was nothing compared to what happened at the festival. There, Emma openly flirted with other guys and artists, acting like Sam did not even exist. Every minute, the anger inside Sam grew stronger and stronger. So strong, it would burst out the very next day with fatal consequences. On September 13th, the three returned from the concert to Emma's house, where Sam now felt stuck. It would be several days before his flight back home, and even then, he would have to reveal to his family that the girlfriend he had been bragging about didn't even like him. One more failure in his miserable life. Sam needed to take the control back. When September 16th then came, and Melanie had not returned home as agreed, her mother Kathleen called to Emma's house. The first few calls went without anybody picking up. But then, Sam answered the phone. According to him, the girls had gone out to the movies. However, Kathleen felt something weird was going on, so she contacted Mark, Emma's father, to go check and see if everything was all right. So he did. But Kathleen never heard back from him. On September 18th, 2009, Kathleen continued calling the Virginia State Police because she still hadn't heard anything from her daughter. Finally, at around 3.20 that day, Authorities entered Emma's and her mother's house at 505 First Avenue. There, they discovered a gruesome scene. Emma, Melanie, Deborah, and Mark had all been bludgeoned to death by a sledgehammer. Three of the bodies were located in a downstairs bedroom and one in a bedroom upstairs. Sam was nowhere to be found. It was soon discovered that the young man had made his way to the Richmond airport and had bought a ticket back home. Luckily, in the early hours of September 19th, the Virginia State Police were able to locate Sam at the airport, sleeping in the baggage claim. After his arrest, Sam was charged with six counts of capital murder. And yes, there were only four bodies, but in Virginia, if three or more murders are committed in under a year, the defendant is eligible for extra counts. As it was very likely that Sam would have received the death penalty, his defense made an agreement with the state to avoid the trial. On September 20th, 2010, Richard Samuel McCroskey pled guilty to two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of capital murder. He received four life sentences with an additional 632 years in prison. He is currently serving his sentence at the Red Onion State Prison in Pound, Virginia. Since the case never went to trial, we don't know for sure what happened during those few days Sam spent in the Farmville house with the four people he had killed but it seemed that he had been using some electronic devices, possibly even recording rap songs, and in the end was contemplating suicide. Sam himself has not given an explanation for what he did, but when his MySpace and YouTube accounts were discovered, including his rap songs about killing and death, the news went crazy. 
They attempted to blame hardcore and juggalo subcultures for the brutal Farmville murders. After all, both Sam and Emma's parents had expressed concerns over the violence in their children's favorite new music. However, the supporters of these music genres argued that the music they love is just a dark fantasy. According to them, there has to be something wrong in the individual's head if they would act out gruesome scenarios portrayed in the songs. Many studies actually support this claim, as tests have shown fans of violent music, just like non-fans, show a robust bias to process violent imagery. These results suggest that long-term exposure to music with aggressive themes does not lead to general desensitization to violence, despite common opinions. The Farmville murders were more of an example of what can happen when you put together a young man with a fragile and disturbed mind and one final rejection after a life of nothing but failure. Sam lived in a fantasy world, and Emma was part of it. When he then could not have her, nobody could. Unfortunately, there was a huge amount of collateral damage, and four lives were lost because one's fantasy could not become a reality. Blaming the music only gives society an excuse to put off addressing the real problem. That's today's 10-minute murder. Brief and bingeable true crime. Thanks for listening today. And a quick message to all of you that get out and do that Black Friday shopping thing. Y'all crazy. This past Black Friday, I was just trying to go get coffee. And I realized it was the worst possible day to go out and do that. Uh, but Target is my safe space. But you guys, you Black Friday shoppers, you give me anxiety. So I had to go sniff candles for like 12 minutes to lower my heart rate. Anyway, thanks for listening to the story today. I already said that. But uh, hey, if you have friends and you know that they are into true crime and maybe have a touch of attention deficit disorder, let them know about 10 Minute Murder. The episodes are brief. You don't have to focus for too long. And the host is weird, but like weird in a cool way, right? Okay, I'm hushing. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and have a good night.